Are you ready to turn your investments into retirement income? Listen in as Jeremy Kyle and his guests reveal ways you can make smarter retirement, investment, and tax planning decisions to achieve your ideal retirement. You will learn more about your money so you can feel better about your money and make better money decisions. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into a consistent income. We brought somebody on, someone I've known for a few years through a few old uh, connections, but he's written a new book. So let's go out with the old and in with the new, and it's a new book. Bob DePasquale wrote Personal Finance in a Public World, How Technology, Social Media, and Ads Affect Your Money Decisions. Bob, thanks for coming on the show. Jeremy, I am pumped to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Love your show, by the way. I've been a listener for quite a while, so appreciate the honor to be your guest. Appreciate that too. Yeah, it's it's fun to to connect. Um, is a great thing to hear that you've been listening to our show and, and that you you do like it. I'm going to talk about what a great author you are and podcaster. And so it did mean a lot when you told me that. It's it's awesome. <laughs> well, we got uh, connected through a place called Thriving a few years back, and I was getting some research done because I thought, what what do we need to know here about Bob? But you tell me if I'm wrong. Were you in sports radio beforehand? Yes, I was. I have a master's degree in broadcast journalism. So whatever I mess up here on the podcast, you can blame on my professors back in the day. But uh, out of grad school, I worked in sports radio for a couple of years. Loved it. Really appreciated that. If I wasn't going to be an athlete, I was going to talk about sports for a sure. living. <laughs> then I got recruited by Thrivent into the financial industry. And, and that was in 2010 or late 2009. So it's been a while, but yes, I, I was in sports radio. Yeah, got it. Oh, that's awesome. I imagine it's a, a different, maybe culture, a different, uh, just a different industry, finance versus sports radio. Oh, you betcha, man. Completely different animal. That is talking about broadcasting and p trying to put as many controversial opinions out there as you possibly can versus the conservative nature of financial planning and making sure people's nest egg is protected. That's true. Well, I'm, I'm sure you did uh, good at the sports radio part, but you, I'm, I, I know for a fact you're doing good at the uh, uh, financial <laughs> part of it and the conservative stick to your guns kind of, kind of nature, uh, yes, part sir. of it. Yeah. Well, you went out and actually started your own business before we start talking about your book. What's that like to actually start a business? Wow. That that's a loaded question. My friend, after working with business owners for so many years in my previous role, I thought it would be a little bit easier to be honest with you, but it's been a, a healthy challenge for the past year or so that my business partner and I have been working on our company called Initiate Impact. And it's still in the financial industry. We're still doing the same technical work that we did before, but yes, owning a business is a completely different animal than working for a company. And so we've learned a lot about how to make sure that we have strong messaging and we're able to manage the behind the scenes sort of stuff that most people you, you probably don't see when you're working with an organization. So it has, it, it's been a great, great challenge. And I feel like we're, we're almost 12 months in now, and we're much more well-versed on actually executing some of those tasks uh, that you, you just may not typically think about if you're working for a company. For sure. And then even as, as part of that, you went a little bit different. I think this is a great thing for people that are interested in, in starting a business is that you're very specific about uh, who you work with and how you go about working with them. Do you mind sharing that with us for a little bit? Definitely. I think that was one of the best pieces of advice that I got when we did begin the business. In our previous role, we worked quite with quite a few different families and a different, quite a diversity of people from all the different places in the country and different economic statuses, different jobs and different positions and different mindsets. And it, it was fulfilling work. We enjoyed it, but we were told and advised to really find a, a really strong niche of people that we feel that we work with the best. And so we like to call the families that we work with right now purpose-driven. They have some kind of cause, something that they really, really care about beyond just the bottom line of the business that they're running or or whatever it is that they've done to, to build up that nest egg and, and to build the resources, the financial resources specifically that they have. And we feel that philanthropy is a powerful force in not only in the world, but also in someone's life. And so we, we, we work with people who, who want to make a difference somewhere for somebody else in the world. And it just, it just seems to be a good fit. It's fulfilling work. And we really enjoy that. And when you're a business owner and you're working with people who think the same way, it's, it's just much more fulfilling and it's much easier 
to be effective at what you do because you really care. We, we, we call the people that we work with, the families that we work with partners because we want to partner with them in their mission. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. I have a strong feeling the way that you approach your business is similar to how you approach one of your podcasts, which is speaking of impact. And I'm thinking too, it's just an interesting thing on the, on the business side that uh, it, it is somewhat wonderful just to start out your career and experience a lot of different areas and then find the one thing you're most passionate about. And when you become passionate about something, you just have a, a different way of approaching that area. And because of that, you're, you're meeting people that are in that similar way of, of, of mindset or, or similar category where you can just become deeper in how you help the people. And that probably is where you get a better impact is by just knowing more and helping more the similar type of, of people there. And so that's, that's, you're on the right track. And that's probably why you started your podcast. Speaking of impact, what, what's that one about? hundred percent. I'm right with you, man. You're, you're, you're speaking my story. I don't even know if I need to, to answer the question. You could probably answer it for me because <laughs> it, it, yeah, we are super passionate about people making a positive impact in the world. And the podcast began before the business as somewhat of a passion project, because I wanted to talk with people, more people on a less formal platform about what really drives them to care about something deeper than just th than themselves, right? I mean, we're all humans. We want to be part of something bigger. And I found that people who find that thing, that something bigger, because it's not the same thing for everyone. There's, there's a million different causes and places that you can spend your time and resources in this world. But I found that the people who have found it are extremely, extremely driven and really interesting people that we can learn from. And so the podcast is about talking with people who are doing something that they love and making a positive impact in the world while doing it. And the, the amount of things that I've learned about life and the world in the 80 or so episodes that we've released now is unbelievable. I can't even, I, I could not have planned, predicted that that amount of information could be shared in, in just 45 minute conversations with people right. in podcast format. So it's been a great experience because I'm using, I'm, I'm scratching a little bit of that itch for broadcasting that I, right. that I studied, yep. but I'm also doing uh, great things and I'm promoting, hopefully promoting great messages in the world. So yeah, it's been great. Podcasting's an, an awesome experience. So I've learned, I've learned about life and I've also learned about business from doing a podcast too, which I, I know you've got quite a bit of experience. You could probably echo that. Yeah. I'm curious. What's the number one, what story just jumps to your mind uh, when you're thinking about your podcast that that was more just, just what's the first one that comes to your mind? First one. Absolutely. So my former Spanish teacher, so this is kind of a, a kind of a funny situation here. My high school Spanish teacher and my high school English teacher, or, or one of my high school Spanish teachers and one of my high school English teachers were married and they All were, right. they were a very well-known couple at the school that the high school that I went to down in Fort Lauderdale. And they were known for teaching there. And also they owned a bakery and they would give away hundreds and probably thousands of cookies to the school every year. And they were very, very, they, they, I mean, they were micro famous in our area for their, the Aloma cookies and their name was Aloma. I actually played football with one of their sons. Come to find out one of their other sons lived in my neighborhood years, year, years later. Well, shortly after I had left and graduated high school, my, my Spanish teacher left the left the school he did to stop teaching and became the executive director of an organization called food for the poor and he's since retired now but he became the executive director there and i knew i wanted to get him on the podcast and i thought we, i thought i was going to bring him on the podcast and he was going to talk about what it was like to be a teacher and change the lives of young people and then go work for a nonprofit. well he ended up telling this story about a gentleman that he met while he was doing some service work with food for the poor in another country and he told this beautifully eloquent story about how the gentleman had lost his ability to dream and mm -hmm. he had no hope with his life anymore. He was going through the motions and he was doing everything he could to help his family survive, but he had lost the ability to dream. And the way he described it was amazingly beautiful and motivating to make sure that anyone in the world that you know, that has lost that ability to dream, that they get it back. Because yeah. it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're five years old, 50, or, or even 100. If you've lost the ability to dream, then you've lost the ability to live freely. 
Yeah, I believe that. And that's, you know, I'm gonna have to find that one. You'll have to send me that exact episode. So we'll put that in the show notes so people can listen to that episode. Cause that's, that sounds like it's gonna be quite a, quite a touching story. Absolutely. Good. Well, speaking of stories, you wrote a book and I've been reading the book. I got to tell you, I love that you are a storyteller. I, I could tell that right away from page one. And it was so wonderful that it was just drawing me in and it was being, it was better able to, I'm kind of a facts guy. You might not have a, realize that about me. A lot of people probably do realize about me. And so I just appreciate how you're able to explain a lot of financial concepts by introducing and relating it to a, a story and anecdote. And so I just, as a, um, I guess wanted to tell you that, that was a, I appreciate the way that you're approaching a book. And for people that uh, read the book, you'll, you'll get a lot more out of it because of the, the way that Bob went through it and wrote the book. So what you wrote a book, why did you do it? I wrote the book for, for two different main reasons. Number one is I think people are stressed a lot about technology and money, both of those topics. And in my life, I know that there are times where money has been an amazingly positive tool in my life. And there's also times where it's been an amazingly negative tool. And the same thing goes for technology. It can be a time waster, but it can also be a time saver. And so in my, with my experience in working with families and their money, I felt like I had a pretty good handle on some of the finer details of budgeting, debt management, savings, investing, insurance, a lot of the things that you might cover on your podcast here. But what I didn't understand is the technology and the psychology behind money. And I needed to, to understand that better. And one of the biggest pieces of advice, the best pieces of advice when I set out to write the book was, is it's not about how much you know, it's about how much you want to know, or it's not about what you know, but it's about what you're curious about. And so that curiosity sent me down a couple of rabbit holes of technology and psychology that inspired me to combine those topics to help people use technology for a positive effect in their lives so that they can have a great relationship with their money. So that's the main reason why I wrote the book, because I felt like people need to hear that message. And then the second reason is in our transition into my new business, I knew that we were making quite a change and I was going to be quite, spending quite a bit of time building this new business. And I would not have the time to spend on some of these finer details and topics that I would like to talk about in the book. So I said, well, if I can't work one-on-one -on -one with families and individuals to do this, why don't I write a book about it so that they, I can provide that information to the masses? And so personal finance in a public world was born. And that's how it came to be. That's perfect. And you, you've you actually done it. You've written the book, you've published it, you've actually publicized it. I've had a somewhat of a dream, like I think a lot of people perhaps have had of, oh, I'll write a book someday. What am I perhaps in for? What's it like to write a book, publish it, publicize it? What What goes on all there? <laughs> That's an excellent question because I always ask the exact same thing to the guest on my show that I've written a book. I think writing a book is quite an endeavor and there's two sides, the behind the scenes. And then there's the, you mentioned about publicizing the book, right? So now my job is to tell people all about the book and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. It looks cool doing a photo shoot and taking pictures of yourself to smile and be promotional and have a little bit of have a little bit of arrogance is probably all all a good thing. <laughs> it feeds the ego, my friend. And so that's the fun part of a book. And there are some things that aren't maybe as enjoyable, if you will, but they have to get done. So behind the scenes, it's a lot of work to do the research. I had some assistance and advice about how to do research and how to to get interviews. I mean, I interviewed over forty people and professionals in, in technology, finance, and psychology for the book. So I was coached up on how to reach out to people, how to ask good questions, how to follow up with them, because you know you're always going to have follow-up questions, the promotional aspect of it, how to make people aware, press releases, editing. I mean, I have six different editors worked on the book, and they all had different titles. I, I you know, I, Honestly, Jeremy, I thought an editor was like a job, right? You're an editor. Right. There's yep. one... There's one type of editor, but come to find out there's multiple different kinds. There's copy editors, there's developmental editors, there's marketing editors. I mean, there's different editors for everything. So I learned quite a bit about the process of writing a book and, and the 
outside of the the anecdote that I gave you earlier about it's about what you want to learn and about being curious more than what you already know. The other thing that I would say is it really takes a community to write a book. It's if you've ever heard the the saying before it takes a community to raise a child. Well, the book was kind of like my child for the past year. I had to have a community of people around me, including those editors and the people I interviewed, but also friends and family and other professionals that enabled me to put it all together. It's not, it's not the, the, the book has over 50,000 words in it. It wasn't like I started with word number one and eight months later, I wrote word number 50,000. It's a whole puzzle. And it's almost like, if you ever read one of those choose your own adventure books back in the day when you were sure. younger? Oh yeah. That's what every book really is. It bounces around like that. You just don't know it once it publishes. <laughs> right. So it's, it was great. It was cool. It was fun. Well, that's good. Well, I was going to say that too, that you definitely had a team behind you and I, I read books, you get to the end and they thank like 12 people that weren't even listed in the book. And you're thinking, who are these people? And that's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's all the different uh, editors and, and people that were uh, working so hard on it. Awesome. Absolutely. It's Jeremy Kyle here, and I know you're listening to the Retirement Reveal Podcast because you want to learn more about making great retirement decisions. I've created a free video course for you to do just that. Head over to 5stepretirementplan.com and sign up to receive this video training right in your email inbox. We broke down our 5-step retirement plan into bite-sized videos so you can get started on the retirement, investment, and tax planning you need to create a consistent retirement income. Go to 5stepretirementplan.com Use the number or spell it out. You'll get there either way. Five step retirement plan.com. Thanks for listening. And now for the rest of the show. Well, let's, let's stop teasing about this book. Let's, let's talk about it. You have a, the message of the book. And I think the, so your subtitle is how technology, social media, and ads affect your money decisions. Maybe just give me an overall picture of what the book is like. And I'm wondering if you can even break it down at each of those three, like how does technology affect your money? How does social media affect your money? how to ads affect your money. Let's, let's see if we can do it that way. Sure. I'd love to break it down. The first, the first quote and point from the book I'll share with you is that there was a study done and on average, we tap, swipe, and click our devices 2,617 times per day. Think about that. Yeah. 2,000. Now we're math guys. We're facts guys. We could probably break that down to how many times per hour it is. Can't right. do that math. That's exactly head. what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah. I know you well. So it's like a hundred ish. There you go. Bro. So a hundred times per hour. That that's incredible. Now my parents or our parents would probably say, well, that's too much. You can't spend that much time on your device and your phone. You got to be more traditional and interacting with people around you. Like I used to do back in the day. And then I might talk to some of the teenagers that my, my wife and I mentor, and they would tell me, well, I do everything on my phone. If I didn't have my phone, I, I wouldn't be alive. And so I think that there's a happy medium somewhere. And when you talk about breaking it down between those three aspects, I can absolutely do that. What I found is they're very, very highly interrelated, but technology you and I work in the financial industry. So we know how many different forms of technology and pieces uh, of information that we can gather in our industry. They call it the tech stack, right? We can use all mm -hmm. these different softwares yep. to, to, to help us with our finances. There are plenty of opportunities out there to use technology as a positive force in your life. So that, so the first thing that I would say is the tools that we have are very, very powerful. It's just how we use them. And so if you can identify the couple applications or programs that you might use on your computer to help you with your finances, like for example, you may want to use QuickBooks to do accounting. And most people have heard of that or that company and that software. So that's why I use it. But that's an example of a tool that we could use for positivity. If we think we're going to use every single one out there, that's impossible. There's no way that we don't even need all of those. So mm -hmm. I give advice. I always tell people, figure out the couple tools that you need that work best for you, whether it's the application that your credit union or your bank offers for you to help with your budgeting, or maybe you use a, an app like Mint to help you with those things. Uh, if you have a, if you have some, some debt that you're worried about, there's plenty of technology pieces out there that can help you with debt. So technology, I believe can be a very, very powerful tool in our life. That's 
a big portion of what we talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. Talk about social media. That's an offshoot of the, of technology. It's just another form of technology. The thing that I found, and you'll see some stories in the book about how tech, how social media affects you as well, is that social media is designed to, to grasp our attention. It's very, it, it's very inviting the algorithms, the systems. And this is where I had to do a lot of research because this is not my expertise originally. And so these algorithms and programs that are designed by developers, they are built to get, to catch our attention, not necessarily to provide us information. So social media is a big one because it's designed one way. However, there are some also some very positive forces on social media as well. And I think if you can use and find and curate your social media feed so that maybe some of those 2,617 swipes a day that you have, maybe instead of half of them being enticing you to buy things, what if half of them were being helpful or providing positive information about what you can do with your budget and your debt and potentially your investments or insurance? So social media, we can't get away from it. There's a lady by the name of Shelly Turkle. You might want to look her up. She's done yeah. extensive yep. research on technology and systems and artificial intelligence and how it affects our brains and, and what it means for society. Well, she talks about in her writings about we're not going to get away from social media and technology. It's not as if we can say, well, let's just eliminate these tools from our life. No, they're there. They're, they're only getting better and more powerful. So instead of trying to avoid them, why not use them for good? Mm -hmm. And so that's my encouragement. Find the social media platforms, curate your feeds with things that mean that do well for you and your relationship with money, because they are designed to feed you what you want. The algorithms are designed to give you back the information that you put in. So put in good stuff, good stuff will come out. And then number three, ads. And I'm specifically talking about them in this order because that's the way, it, it's the easiest way to understand them. You have technology, one form of technology is social media. And then one of the most powerful forces on social media and the reason why these organizations exist like Instagram and Facebook and TikTok is because of ads. We don't pay to use those platforms. Although, although LinkedIn has a premium service where you can actually pay, most of them are designed to be free for the consumer. And then they make money by selling ads. And one of the stories I tell in the book early on in the book, I don't know if you've gotten to that point in it yet, Jeremy, but my friend who's a, a huge media buyer has a digital agency for, for huge brands, spends millions of dollars every month on social media ads. We had a, a deep conversation about how uh, this technology affects us. And ironically, he showed me an ad once and he had just moved down from New Jersey to, to Florida. And I knew that he, it was the first, first night in his new apartment. And he said to me, Oh, hang on a second. I'm cooking dinner. And I said, Joe, you're cooking. Oh, wow. How are you cooking dinner? You just move You're a single guy. You probably got boxes everywhere. Why don't you just order a pizza for dinner or something? And he said, no, I have this oven. And he sent me a link to this oven that he uses. You know, it's one of these fancy things. You pop the food mm -hmm. in the oven and it cooks it in like 15 minutes. It's like a gourmet meal. I don't know how it works, but anyway, and he sends me this ad or just a website. I click on it and it was late at night. I must've looked at it for 10 seconds. And I went to bed shortly after that. I said, Hey man, congratulations on your move. Glad you're safe. Glad you're here. You know, we'll catch up this weekend. Well, I kid you not, Jeremy, the next morning I opened up my phone and that oven chased me around the internet and all of my social media apps for the rest of the day. It knew that I went to that website the night before. So these ads are very, very powerful. And so we have to figure out how to navigate that. It can be very tempting. I mean, I could easily pull open my phone and buy a thousand dollars worth of stuff that I looked at on the internet yesterday. So there's some important messaging in the book on how to make sure that the social media ads uh, are not leading our buying decisions, maybe leading our uh, curiosity, but not leading our buying decisions, because ultimately we got to have a plan uh, for spending our money and, and using the resources that we've earned well. Yeah. I got to say, first off, good for you for not checking your phone till the next morning. Cause I got a few on the ads are waiting for you there. They're instantly there. Yes. They would have, they would have caught you in five minutes. Uh, at bedtime there, if you gave them a chance. So, so good for you 
on that. Now I'm going to push back a little bit on there. Cause it's, I hear this all the time where people are um, concerned about the level of, of knowledge that the advertising companies have about people and, and that, Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, I was thinking about this thing I was going to buy. And all of a sudden I started seeing the ads for it. And the way I th- think about it is, do you want to see ads for things you don't want? You know, it just seems like, Hey, if they're going to spend their dollars, why not um, look at things that maybe you probably, probably do want. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, well, Jeremy, I'm glad you brought this up. Totally acceptable pushback because I think that's a key teaching of the book is that it's better that we're at least seeing things that interest us and not things that are completely off the board. For example, the way that ads used to work, if you were watching, I don't know, the Super Bowl or something, you know, a big broadcast, whichever advertiser had the most money, right? You, we saw the Budweiser mm-hmm. Clydesdales every Christmas. Right on the ads because they had the most money and it was the companies that had the most money. Now it's not necessarily like that. It's what we show interest in. And so there's a couple of ways to, if you do want to to minimize the amount of things that you're seeing that are tempting you, if that's, if that's you, everyone's different now, if that's you, there are ways to not accept the cookies for the browsers. And I talk a little bit more about the technology there, but there are ways to set up the systems that you have to be less curated to exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. But on the side of what you're saying, yes, it's probably better that at least we're seeing things that we want, but that's where budgeting and understanding your personal financial situation are vitally important and and understanding the difference between wants and needs and what your discretionary budget is versus what your non-discretionary budget is. And so there's other forms of technology and, and budgeting applications that will help you be able to experience and see those ads, but not have them throw a knife into your financial plan and your situation. So yes, personally, I would prefer to see things that are actually interesting to me. I don't generally have a, you know, a quick trigger finger on the Amazon one click buy ads, but Mm -hmm. uh, if you are, there are certainly ways to, uh, to, to combat that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you share some of those, like in Apple, you can switch to the private viewing mode so that they're not really tracking your, what you're looking for. I think in Google Chrome, it's uh what incognito, something like that. So there's ways mm-hmm. that you can kind of go about it. And you talk about these things called uh, cookies. I'll have you maybe finish with that. Cause who doesn't want to finish anything without cookies, right? So we'll, <laughs> we'll finish on that um, in a second, but I love, I'll, I'll get back to your story. Cause I read that story in your book and I think you very, you brought it up a little bit that you, your friend likes it. I mean, that's how a lot of people buy stuff anyways, is cause they hear about it from their friends. And it was probably about eight hundred dollars. I think you said was this uh, this oven, yes. and you had said, okay, it's it's not like you're going to be in the poor house if you had bought that. But they at the same time, it wasn't in your budget because you thoughtfully created a budget, and so thankfully you had done the kind of pre work ahead of time. So the the ads are more of a curiosity to you than like, oh yeah, I should actually go out and buy this this one thing. That's a great way to put it. The ads. The ads are a curiosity and there's definitely a difference between curiosity and necessity. Right. And so one of the things on this topic that I think is super important that I realized in my research for the book and talking with individuals and also professionals in psychology space is that I'm a big proponent of identifying the wants that we have, like the, the things that we really, that really bring us joy and the things that we really, really like, but don't necessarily need. And if we can have Mm -hmm. a short list there, right? For someone, for some people, it might actually be going to Starbucks every day. Yep. I was thinking of that one right away. Yeah. (laughs) Right. The latte factor. Yeah, exactly. Am I a big fan of $8? I don't even like coffee to begin with. So thankfully I don't fall into this category. I'm I'm actually very, very blessed. But if, if the $8 coffee is your thing and that truly is, that brings you joy and, and it's helpful in your day, I'm not going to tell anyone not to buy that. Uh, but that's got to be one of your very, very, you know, on your very, very short list of things that it's well. And the reason why I say this is because if we have fulfillment and joy by purchasing cert- certain things that that are acceptable and reasonable in your budget, I mean, if you're, if you're going to find fulfillment by buying a Lamborghini every day, I, okay, then we have a problem. But unless it's in your budget. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you're right. There are some people that it might be in your budget. <laughs> yeah. Um, but find those things, get your fulfillment and your joy and your satisfaction from those finer things in life that, that are finer to you. 
And, and I, it's, I mean, it's overwhelming evidence. I found that all of those other things that are tempting aren't as tempting when you're satisfied by the things that are on your short list. So I, like I that. always encourage yep. people to those couple things that, that you can spend your discretionary dollars on that you really like, go ahead, spend it on those things because the other things will be that less tempting. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I imagine that people would, if they're intentional about it, that's in their budget and they they know, okay, I can do this thing or buy this thing every so often because it, it fits in the in a line item. Awesome. Exactly. Good. Well, Bob, I, I tease this. I think we're gonna have to learn about cookies because we gotta finish just about everything with cookies. Let's let's <laughs> hear about this. What are cookies? Why should people care? I, I love it. So cookies are this thing that you bake and they taste really good. Oh no, wait a minute. Yes. Those are different. <laughs> um, I, by the way, I love baked goods. That's another hobby of mine. Uh, but so, so cookies are things that your browser uses to, to it, it's information that your browser stores about websites that you've already visited. And once again, it's a really powerful tool because it helps speed up a browsing experience. So you don't have to waste as much bandwidth and internet. Here we are using an internet connection to record mm-hmm. this interview if I was to sh- if I was to go to a web page, it could potentially slow that connection down. Right. But the the computers use these to store basic information so that when you reload a web page, it doesn't have to reload the entire web page. I, I, I couldn't give you the percentages. I'm this is not my industry, but a certain percentage of that information is stored natively on your computer, and so sure. it doesn't have to pull it from the internet. So the positive is it can speed things up. The negative is that stored information is also stored on the other end. So that, so, so, so those websites know who you are and they have information about you. And that's how the ads can come back up. So if I go back to a website I've already visited, it already knows a little bit about me and it could potentially feed me information that could be tempting for me to make a purchase on it because of an ad. Right. And that's the uh, personal finance part in a public world, right? If they're figuring out personality wise, what it is you're, you're looking for and liking, then the, those public companies can go out and try to sell you some stuff and that could affect your finances. So I appreciate you you talking through it and you did a lot of research. So everyone that listened to it, check out the book, personal finance in a public world. Uh, if you made it to the end, which is wonderful, like when people do that to reward you first three people that email me, Jeremy, J E R E M Y at Kyle F P K E I L F P.com. I'll send you a copy of Bob's book. Everyone else, check it out on Amazon. I imagine that's probably the place to go, right? Yes, sir. You can get it on on just about any platform, but Amazon's the probably the easiest, correct? Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your message here about how technology, social media, and ads affect your money decisions. Thanks, man. It's a pleasure to be on Retirement Revealed. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for joining us on the Retirement Revealed podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Revealed podcast. Click on the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit retirement-revealed.com to learn more. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Kyle Financial Partners. Kyle Financial Partners does not provide legal, accounting, or tax advice. Consult your attorney or tax professional. Representatives have general knowledge of the Social Security tenants. For complete details on your situation, contact the Social Security Administration. Kyle Financial Partners is a part of the Thrivent Advisor Network, a registered investment advisor. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.